like to turn with me to Lord's Day 31, and we're just going to do the, uh, the second question and answer, and then, Lord willing, I'll finish up um, a couple weeks on Sunday night, not next week. But uh, Lord's Day 31, and then we'll, I'll uh, read the question, question 84, and then if you'll read back responsibly the answer. Uh, question and answer 84, how does preaching the gospel open and close the kingdom of heaven? According to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is opened by proclaiming and publicly declaring to each and every believer that as often as he accepts the gospel promise in true faith, God, because of what Christ has done, truly forgives all his sins. The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to unbelievers and hypocrites that as long as they do not repent, the anger of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on this gospel testimony. And then if you'll turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 at verse 49. Jesus speaking, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And I will end there and uh, let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read um, your holy infallible word, a word that we know comes from heaven and a word that is true in every aspect, but also a word that that there's depth to hear, Lord. And and again, it's it's a sobering word. Um, so, Lord, we pray, be with me, be with my mouth, bring forth a good word, and we pray, too, that you'd be with each one here present, that you'd strengthen, encourage, and lift up your people by your word and spirit, but also, Lord, that you would convict, um, that you would, that there, there are many of us that need your word to, we need that, that word to rebuke us at times, and that's, that's a fact and a reality. So we pray, Lord, that if we need that rebuke, that you'd give it. But we also pray, too, for those that do not yet know you, that do not yet know your love, your mercy, and your goodness, and also do not fully realize either the condemnation that comes to those that do not yet know you. Lord, have mercy on them. Open their hearts, open their minds, and turn them and give them all that they need so that they might uh, humble themselves before thee and confess you as Lord and Savior. All these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. So this last week, we started looking at this, uh, this Lord's Day 31, which is speaking about the, the keys of the kingdom. And, and last week, I just wanted to, uh, you know, we see the idea of the keys of the kingdom in, in uh, Matthew 16, um, where it speaks about, I, Jesus says to, to his disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And, and, and the, the wording of binding and loosing speaks particularly of sin, right? That, that um, the binding of someone's sin means that that sin is stuck with them. The loosing means it's taken away. It's let go of, right? So that your sins are loosed. You are loosed from your sins, literally. And, and so these keys are given to the, to the church, to the church on earth, and, and, uh, and they're given to the, to the elders of the, of the local congregations that are given these keys, which is just a kind of a, uh, I, think it's an, uh, I think it's a frightening thing 
not so much even for the congregation as much as it is for the elders and the pastors themselves. Because that is a heady, heady thing that, that God is entrusting you, a human being, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a jar of, of, of dirt, so to speak, right? We're, um, we are flesh and blood. There's nothing special about us apart from anyone else. And, and um, we are broken human beings also. And to entrust this, this authority to bind and to loose, that, that's, a, that's a frightening thing, and I, th- I think it should be. And so like last week, what we did is we looked first at just the idea of the spirit and the kind of spirit that we should have. And we looked at it in Luke chapter 9, and the, 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 the spirit of humility, the spirit of long-suffering, and finally, the spirit of salvation, right? The Son of Man did not come to destroy life, but to save. And, and so that's the first thing as, as elders, particularly as elders and pastors, that we'd be filled with the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and that we would be very careful um, to, you know, we do not, elders and, and pastors have no authority on their own, zero Everything that we say and do needs to come from the Word of God, and it needs to be true and faithful to that Word of God. That's the only authority that we have. And, and that's a fact, and that's a reality. So, um, so say, having said that now, so what is the first key of the kingdom? The first key that, that, that we speak of in, in the catechism is the preaching of the Word of God. And by this key, right, by the preaching of the Word of God, the kingdom of heaven is opened and shut, right? So the preaching of the word of God is a powerful, powerful thing because it opens, God uses the preaching to open the kingdom and to shut the kingdom. And so we're going to get into the text in just a moment, but I wanted to give one more note uh, of, to elders and to those that um, will be in that, in that position someday this is why it's so critical and so important for the, for the elders to understand what preaching is about. This is, this is why they need to listen. This is why they need to learn. And, and this is why they need to pay attention. Because think about it. This is, and, and our church order picks this up too, right? It, it talks about the idea of maintaining the purity of the word and sacraments. That is, that is church order wording talking about the elders' responsibility to maintain the purity of the word. And here's why. Because the kingdom of God is opened and shut by it. And so even if you're not up here preaching, you're responsible. Is that preaching faithful to the word of God? Is he faithful to the text? Is he preaching the truth? Is he preaching it in the manner that it's given to us in the word? Is he being faithful to the sense of it? Because this is a critical thing. If the kingdom of God is being opened and shut by the preaching, then the elders have to take seriously that idea that, that we're listening carefully and, and we're wanting to learn. And, we're, and we want that pastor needs to be preaching the word of God faithfully because that's part of our responsibility. And they do that for your sakes to the congregation. They do that for your sakes, but more than anything, they do it for the sake of the fact that they're gonna stand before God and have to give an accounting of that too. Did we do that? Were we faithful to that calling? So, having said that, now let's, look at the, let's begin to look at the text here. In, in Luke chapter um, 12, we have this, this word that seems to kind of almost come out of nowhere where Jesus all of a sudden says, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. And that hits us, right? That's a word that all of a sudden is like, whoa. Where did that come from? Because we don't usually think of fire in the same terms as peace and love, right? And just humanly speaking, we don't think of fire and peace and love as going together. So how do these things relate, right? Why is um, why is Jesus saying these, this kind of a thing? Um, let me get the right page here. So what is he speaking about when he talks about, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled? He's talking about the cross. He's talking about the cross and what he's going to do on the cross 
and what it's going to do for the whole world. Right? Because he's, what, he, what he's really talking about is how the Holy Spirit is going to be unleashed. Right? He's talking about the, how the cross will open the door for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It's no accident that on the day of Pentecost, that on those 120 believers that are waiting, according to the word of God, I believe in the temple, that you have the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and then you have tongues of fire. There's a reason for that, right? It's connected to, the, to this whole idea of, of what Jesus is doing on the cross or has done on the cross. Um, uh, or Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one, the one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then it goes on to say, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly, thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So here we have fire on both sides. He is going to um, baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then later on, with his winnowing fan, he's going to separate the chaff from the, from the, from the wheat. And then the chaff is going to be um, burned with unquenchable fire. So the gospel comes into the world, brothers and sisters, with real power. The power to save and the power to condemn. And, and that's what you and I have to understand. Because what Jesus does on the cross is, is opening a door, right? Because I was listening, I don't even know who I was listening to or what I was reading, um, probably in the last two, three, four months or something. But they asked about the difference of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, and how the Spirit moves, you know, in those two eras. And they would say that, and, and I thought, whoever I was listening to, said it very well, because what they said, it's, it's a matter of magnitude. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was very much at work, but not in the magnitude that he is after the cross. After the cross, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit um, sends out the kind of power that actually sends people to the ends of the earth. And, and so the, the, the power and the magnitude of the Holy Spirit being poured out because of what Christ has done um, on the cross, it's, it's just almost, in, in some ways, no, no comparison. There's a comparison in the reality of what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament to what the Holy Spirit does in the New Testament, but the magnitude of it, it's just, it's, it's far and away way more, right? Um, what is hard and difficult for us to understand is that the work of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the Word of God is a two-edged sword. So when we talk about the gospel, a lot of times we desire just to think about, well, Jesus died on the cross so that all your sins can be forgiven. And, and sometimes we have a tendency to forget the other side of the story, that we first have to be convicted of why we need a Savior and why I need someone to die on the cross for my, for my sins. And, and that's a huge part of this story tonight. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, we read this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Think about a two-edged sword. There's a reason why he uses the word two-edged sword. Right? It's, it's very simple for us to think, like, wow, well, a preacher's just up there, and he's warning these people, etc. Well, let me tell you something. The sword of the Holy Spirit cuts both ways. And no minister can be standing up anywhere if he's not daily examining himself. If he's not daily, the Holy Spirit's not working in his heart, in his mind, convicting him, pointing out his sins, his errors, and, and, and correcting him daily. It's a two-edged sword. But listen to, to how special the sword is piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Now, let me ask you something. Does anybody know where the soul ends and the spirit begins or where the spirit ends and the soul begins? There's a reality there. I don't know what it is, though, and I can't tell you. I can't tell you the difference about what the soul is versus even what the spirit is, right? There, there's some people that study that kind of a thing. Uh, I just haven't had that opportunity yet, but the soul and the spirit seem to be um, somewhat different, but we all have, every human has a spirit, and every human has a soul, but they're not exactly the same thing. But the sword of the spirit, the sword of the word of God, um, can divide between even that, and of the joints and the marrow, and, it, and is a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart, right? Right? 
the Holy Spirit, the sword of the word that works through the spirit into your heart and mind, you can't hide from it. It sees everything in you. It sees the things that you cannot see. It sees the things about you that you may not even know about yourself. And God is more than willing to reveal them to you. He wants you to know these things. But sometimes, in his love, he reveals them to us a little bit at a time, because sometimes it might be too much. Right? He sees everything. There is no, uh, he is a discerner of the thought and the intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now remember how this starts out. That the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the word of God, and it's the word of God preached that goes by the work of the Holy Spirit, goes into the very deepest and darkest crevices in your heart, mind, and soul in ways that we cannot even understand. It gets down in there, and, 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 and it lays bare who you are and what you are. The Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever of sin and condemnation and of salvation in Jesus Christ. In verse 50, Jesus says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it's accomplished. Why is Jesus so distressed? Right, we'll, we'll, you'll see how these things connect in just a moment, but why is he so distressed? Let's, let's turn to look at, if you have your Bibles, or, or if you, I, I recommend that you open your Bibles to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. I was listening to, uh, listening or reading, I can't remember, I do both. And I'm old, so I don't remember stuff all as, as good as it should, I should, right? So I was listening or reading someone, and, and, and as a preacher, he was saying, you should always be telling people to open their Bibles and look. Because I can speak a word, that's fine. And, and by God's grace, hopefully it'll be a faithful word. But you, the children of God in Christ, need to have the word of God open to you, right? Because that's the word, the Spirit's gonna work through that word, and I can't preach anything that's not in here, and, and you have to see that in the word. Um, so, in Jeremiah 23, verses 19 and 20, we read about uh, the wrath of God. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. And by the way, when I was thinking about this, I had never really seen this or thought about this text before, but I thought about the mighty, the sound of the mighty rushing wind that came on the day of Pentecost too. And I, and I think there's a, there's a sense of this, of exactly what, what's being spoken about right here, the wrath of God. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. That last part, I believe, is actually talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about the cross. It's talking about how the wrath and fury of God against sin is going to fall upon his son. Okay? That he, it will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. God did that. The Father did that on the Son at the cross. And what is so powerful about this text, brothers and sisters, is, is that um, Jesus knew the meaning of this text. He understood, and, and that's why he says what he says. This is why he says, I am so distressed. Right? He understands exactly what the wrath and the fury and the condemnation of God against sin is about. He understands what he's going to have to, uh, he, he, has, he has tasted through the word already a sense of the wrath and the fury of God against sin, and that's going to be laid on his shoulders. And he knows that because that's the only way out for any of us. He understands how that fury is going to all be focused on him, and it's all going to be poured out with all of its intensity on him on that day. 
He knew the meaning. He knew, the, he knew that the whirlwind of God's wrath and fury against sin would have to come down on him. Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced, right? I was thinking about the word in, in Hebrews 4, verse 12, but it talks about it, it pierces between the soul and the spirit. Here he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The gospel speaks of the message of, of real condemnations for our sins and iniquities. That same spirit pierces our hearts with the knowledge and then also opens up the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven for us by declaring that Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of the Father, came down from above and took on human flesh and at the time appointed offered up his body and blood as the perfect Lamb of God. Right? But I want to go back for a moment because I want to expand on this for a second. Okay? In, in both Jeremiah 23 and in Luke chapter 12, um, we see the intensity, right? Look at what's happening here in Jeremiah 23. So it's easier for us to look at them. It's, it's not as easy to look at ourselves right now in America. But it's easy to look back and say, wow. He, at one point he calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and then it talks about these false prophets that are coming. And, and, uh, and, and they're speaking to the, to the despisers of God and those people that are doing um, according to the dictates of their own heart. They're doing what they want. And they're telling them that, that, that everything's fine, peace to you, you know, and, and, and God's fine with you. And we look here, and, and it's easy, right? Because, I mean, the easiest thing in the world for any human being is to judge someone else. That's just a fact. It's easy for us to look back in history and say, wow, those foolish, hard-hearted, ungodly people. And, and then the role of these pastors. But brothers and sisters, this is what, this is why I put these two texts together, because what this text does is it shows us something about ourselves. Why are these, why are the people listening to them? Why are they listening to these false prophets? Let me, let me turn to that text a sec. I went and lost my page. Um, confusion. Um, he says here, they continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. Isn't that what you want to hear? Isn't that what you want to sense, is that everything's fine? My life is fine. I'm a decent person, and God loves me, right? Because most people, brothers and sisters, there are people that come from other cultures that weren't raised with the Word of God. But in most cultures that are raised with the Word of God, there's even a sense that, well, I don't know if the Bible is true or whatever, but the bottom line is, is when I die, I don't know where I'm going to go. I'd rather go to the good place than the bad place. I would rather feel that God is good with me. And so false prophets always have a good audience because that idea of the dictates of their own heart. When we're living according to the dictates of our own heart, we don't want to be confronted on that. We want someone to tell us that everything's fine. We want someone to tell us that the life that we're leading in this world is great. You're a Christian. You go to church. You believe the right things. Sure, you enjoy the things of the world. Sure, you enjoy your best life now. Okay? You seem to be living the best life of both parts, right? I have Jesus. I've got eternal life. And I'm living my best life now. And and you don't necessarily feel attention, and then the false prophets tell you, oh, peace to you. God loves you. But that's not how the word of God preached and the working of the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit gets deep into your heart and mind. And he says, you know what? I do love Jesus Christ. But I also love this world. Ask yourself this question, this question. And ask it to yourself honestly. 
You're not doing it for anybody but you and your relationship with the Lord. If the Lord said tonight, I'm going to take you home, how would you feel about that? Are you ready to go? How attached are we to this world? How much do we really love it? And that's why there's an audience, even in the churches all over this country, okay, we've got problems, and there's definitely be better if the other party was in, blah, blah, blah. But are we really seeing how wicked this country is? And I've said it before, and I'll say it now, because I, I, I just think it's a reality. You know, there's the, the old riddle or whatever about the, the frog, that if you're going to if you're going to boil a frog, just put them in cold water and then just turn on the heat and let it slowly heat up, right? And he'll never even know. And by the time he, by the time he realizes that the water's boiling, it's too late. There's a reality. Our brains, especially as sinners, we just adjust to the culture. We just adjust to what things are around us. And we no longer get abhor, we no longer abhor sin, we never, no longer abhor things that 50 years ago, um, even 50 years ago, which was no picnic, I'm just going to tell you, that was no righteous time either, but even 50 years ago, there's things happening today that if 50 years ago, if it would have happened, people would go, oh, no. 50 years ago, there's no way in this country, if you would have had an election and at the heart of that election was whether or not we should have the right to kill children in the womb. Every one of those would have been slammed down. Every one of them in this country 50 years ago. And like I said, it wasn't that righteous back then either. But today, hands down, goes the other way. And so the word of God comes and, and we see it in Jeremiah 23. There's false prophets out there, and the reason that they have so much traction is because we want to feel comfortable. But brothers and sisters, the word of God gives us these stories, and it gives us this truth. It gives us this history. Jeremiah is telling the truth. How do we know? Because everything he said came true. The false prophet said, no, 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 Nebuchadnezzar's not, eh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. This country is as safe as can be. We are secure. God is happy with us. You're doing God's will. God loves you. Peace unto you. Jeremiah says, it's coming. You can't stop it, and it's coming for a reason. It's coming for your sin. It's coming because that's what God's wrath and condemnation is about. God's wrath is a real thing. And the reason I say these things, brothers and sisters, to you is because the Spirit doesn't stop working on us once he brings us from the dark into the light. In fact, if anything, he might start going even deeper because now you can take it. Is the Spirit working on your soul? Is he, is he constantly and consistently, day by day, working in your heart and mind, convicting you, teaching you, rebuking you, exhorting you? Do you hear those things? When the preaching of the Word of God comes and it, and it warns of the, of the coming wrath of God, do you hear that thing and say, you know what? Apart from Christ, I deserve that, right? Because we look back at the time of, of Judah here and we see a, a, a wicked and evil people that are rejecting God's word. And, and if we really study it, then we begin to see this and sense and feel the depth of God's wrath against sin. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? 
Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him? Can we hide from him? Is there any thought of our heart or mind that we can hide from him? Is there any feeling as we look at the world around us and we judge people? It, 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 can we hide that from him? That, that's what he's asking. Do I not fill heaven and earth? And the point that he's making is that I am everywhere and my spirit sees everything. It sees you, it hears you, it knows you like you don't even know yourself. And in verse 29, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Brothers and sisters, the preaching of the wrath of God and the condemnation and his fury against sin and his hatred of sin is absolutely necessary to us. And it remains a constant necessity. Because then and only then can we really understand what Jesus did on the cross. Then and only then can we really understand why he is so upset waiting, right? He is so distressed. Because he understands what he's going to have to take. And when you and I realize in the depth of our hearts how much each one of us is worthy of that condemnation and that fury of God and how, how vain we are. You know, the, the psalmist talks about those things again and again uh, about the, the weight of his sins. They're more than the hairs of my head. He, he says that, that my vanity, the emptiness, the, the vapor, you know, he sees himself and he, he sees himself through the eyes of the spirit and he, and he condemns himself. It's when you see that and when you know with all your heart that what the prodigal son says, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, Father, and I am not worthy to be called your son. That's not just a statement that you doctrinally say. That's a statement that you feel to the very depth of your being. I am not worthy. I am not good. I am not righteous. I am not loving. I love myself and I love this world and I love the things of this world and I love the pleasures of this world and I love the, the, the privileges that we have even in this nation. Am I ready to go right this minute if he calls me? Ask yourself that question. But when I see that, and that's what the word of God does when it's preached. It gets into our hearts. It gets into our souls. It gets deep in there. And we look at that mirror and we do not like what we see. Then God says, here's my son. Because what he went through, he went through for you. I have to see that that wrath of God, that fury of God, that hatred of God, of our culture, and of so many of the things that, and the, and the vanity and the lightness of who we are as humans, I have to see it. I have to know it. I have to feel it. And that's what the preaching of the word of God does. It shows us the condemnation that is, is, belongs to us. It's righteous and good that we be condemned for who and what we are and how we do not love God and do not love our neighbor because only then can I see the beauty, the excellence, the sweetness, the mercy, the grace, the compassion of our Lord, our God, our King, who says, I put this whirlwind of all my fury and all my wrath and condemnation against the wretchedness of man, I put it on him. Look to him. Repent. 
believe. And brothers and sisters, that's the thing that should be with us every day. We should say to God, I want to I wanna keep seeing this culture. I want to see it for what it is. I want to know how deep in my own soul it is. I want to know how it holds me. And I want you to give me grace and strength to look to you and the courage and, and to, to continue to look to you and grow in grace and truth because I don't want to be that person that says, well, Jesus, I love you, but not now. Maybe later. I'm ready to come later. I, I love you, but let me stay here for a while longer. If you're staying to do his work, if you're staying to do his will, which the Apostle Paul says, he says, I have a choice. He says, I can stay which is good for you. It's good for you because he understands how much suffering it is to, 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 to disciple and to be an apostle and, and to preach the gospel and, and to go through trial and sorrows day after day or to be which, with Christ, which is far better. How much do I want to be with Christ? And brothers and sisters, that's what the preaching is about. It's the preaching of the word of God that makes us aware of how much we need him. It's the preaching of, 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 of the word of God that convinces us of wrath and condemnation, the rightful wrath and condemnation. And it's the preaching of the word of God that convinces of us of the awesome sweetness, the grandeur, the infinite love that God has to us in Christ. And his beauty should grow and grow. Not just when you go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, but as you continue to walk along that path, it should grow. The love of Jesus Christ should grow. And it continues to grow. Not why, not because day after day I'm reminded of how good I am now and I'm a decent person and et cetera. No. Because day after day I'm reminded. He loved me so much that he took it all for me, that which I deserve. Amen. Father, once again, we come. We come, we come.